Why do white Christians vote Republican and black Christians vote Democrat? Everyone knows conservative Christians vote Republican. It's like one of the rules of nature. The sun comes up in the east and conservative Christians vote Republican. Unless they're black. Oh right, most African Americans self-identify as Christian and most African Americans vote Democrat. Look at the numbers. In 2016, 81% of white evangelical Christians voted for Donald Trump. For many Christians, it's just assumed the Republican Party is the party for Christians. But what about black Christians? Pew Research interviewed validated voters after the 2016 election. People they could verify actually voted. When they looked at black Protestant Christians, there is no official category for black evangelicals because most pollsters have decided evangelical is a white term, but that's a whole different video. When we look at black Protestant Christians, 96% voted for Hillary Clinton, the Democrat. 96%. So 81% of white evangelical Christians voted for Trump and 96% Six percent of black Protestant Christians voted for Clinton. And it's pretty much like that in every election. White evangelicals vote Republican and black Protestants vote Democrat. Why is that? Don't they read the same Bible, pray to the same God? Which group doesn't understand that they're voting for the wrong party? To make things even more confusing, if we go back to 1890, these guys were Republicans and these guys were Democrats. What happened? How did we end up where we are today? Well, let's go back and find out. In 1870, the 15th Amendment gave African American men the right to vote. Since they had this guy to thank for it, and the brand new Republican Party, and since most Southern slave owners at the time were Democrats, almost all African Americans voted Republican. In fact, the first 23 black congressmen were all Republicans. Not all Southern Democrats were these guys, but enough of them were that newly enfranchised African Americans were not likely to vote Democrat anytime soon. Most Southern Democrats Democrats considered themselves conservatives. That sounds weird to hear. Everyone knows Republicans are conservative and Democrats are liberal. But the two parties didn't shake out so clearly on conservative and liberal until the 1970s and 80s. Conservative Southern Democrats look back in history to happier days, the glory days of the South before Abe Lincoln and those darn Yankees messed up everything. Those darn Yankees. I think that's a Disney film. But Honest Abe didn't last forever, as you may have heard, and things got messy for black Americans pretty quick. Republican presidents kept federal troops in the South to ensure African Americans could vote. But when the 1876 election was in a deadlock with both parties claiming victory, America was in danger of falling into civil war again. A group of Northern Republicans and Southern Democrats met in secret and made a deal. Rutherford Hayes, the Republican candidate, would become president. In exchange, all federal troops, the ones protecting black rights, would be removed from the South. Yep, Northern Republicans sort of threw Southern black people under the bus. After the federal troops were gone, the guys in the pointy hats clamped down hard, and most African Americans now had a hard time voting for anyone. New Jim Crow laws stripped away many of the rights they had just won. So for many black people, the Compromise of 1877 felt like a betrayal at the hands of the Republican Party. Then comes the Great Migration. Living with these guys in charge wasn't much fun, to put it mildly, so millions of African Americans abandoned the South for jobs in new factories in northern cities like Chicago, Cleveland, and Philadelphia. And guess what? In the North, you could vote. Many transplanted African Americans still felt a loyalty to the party of Lincoln, but given the fact that no one in Washington was paying much attention to the needs of black families, the NAACP in 1926 argued that blacks should be loyal to neither party. Between 1868 and 1898, 22 African American representatives were sent to Congress from the South. After federal troops left, Bourbon Democrats' elimination of black votes was so complete that when Oscar de Priest was elected to Congress from Chicago in 1929, there hadn't been an African American in Congress for 30 years. Like all the black congressmen from the 19th century, de Priest was a Republican. And then the Depression. 
Black workers in northern cities were hit hard, with unemployment rates twice as high as white workers. Underwhelmed by Republican President Herbert Hoover's response to the crisis, Americans of all stripes, including African Americans, found hope in the progressive New Deal programs of Franklin Roosevelt, a Democrat. Roosevelt received overwhelming support from northern black voters. When the next African-American candidate, Arthur Mitchell, also from Chicago, won a seat in Congress in 1934, he was something Washington had never seen before, a black Democrat. Over the next 20 years, African-Americans continued voting for both Republican and Democratic candidates, and various civil rights measures were proposed by both Democrats and Republicans. Though today this seems hard to believe, there used to be conservative and progressive wings of both parties. In the Democratic Party, the progressives were northern urban Democrats. The conservatives were the southerners, which, of course, included these guys. In the Republican Party, the progressives were folks like the liberally-minded Rockefeller family. For years, to be a progressive Republican was to be a Rockefeller Republican. The conservative wing was made up of those who wanted the federal government to stay small and stay out of their business. Both conservative Northern Republicans and conservative Southern Democrats opposed the federal government getting bigger and launching more programs. So from the early days of Roosevelt's New Deal right up through the 1960s, a coalition of conservative Republicans and conservative Democrats managed to block just about every attempt at new civil rights legislation. In fact, between 1953 and 1965, more than 120 civil rights measures were considered by the Senate. Almost every one was killed by the Senate Judiciary Committee, a powerful committee at the time controlled by Southern Democrats and conservative Northern Republicans. As the years went by, many more of the new civil rights efforts were proposed by Northern Democrats and fewer by Republicans, motivating more black Americans to vote Democrat with regularity. Yet Southern Democrats were still stalling or blocking nearly every bill. The strain between pro-civil rights Northern Democrats and anti-civil rights rights Southern Democrats was reaching a breaking point, and that break would radically alter American politics. Meet Strom. Strom Thurmond ran for president in 1948 and served in the Senate from 1954 till 2003. Yes, that's a very long time. His career almost perfectly illustrates the shift in political parties over the last 80 years. Strom Thurmond was a Southern Democrat and governor of South Carolina in the late 1940s. He hadn't had a huge problem with Roosevelt's New Deal since Roosevelt didn't mess with segregation in the South. But when Roosevelt's Democratic successor, Harry Truman, integrated the army in 1948 and proposed aggressive civil rights legislation, Southern Democrats like Thurmond had had enough. Thurmond and a group of Southern Democrats protested by forming the State's Rights Democratic Party, a conservative party dedicated to preserving segregation. Thurmond ran for president against Truman in 1948. A sample of his stump speech? There's not enough troops in the army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and admit the Negro race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, and into our churches. No Negroes for me, thank you. That was pretty much it. Thurman lost to Truman badly, and his Dixiecrat Party, that was their nickname because States Rights Democratic Party was a mouthful, the Dixiecrat Party disbanded. Thurman ran for Senate as a Southern Democrat and spent the next 20 years fighting to maintain racial segregation in the South. But the tide was turning against the segregationist Southern Democrats as progressive Northern Democrats and Rockefeller Republicans tried again and again to pass civil rights legislation. In 1960, with civil rights protests really heating up in the South, Northern Democrat John F. Kennedy won the White House. Kennedy was initially reluctant to take a strong stand on civil rights, fearing he would lose all Southern support for the rest of his agenda. But after watching attempts to integrate Southern universities end in violence, Kennedy spoke up. In a speech to the nation on June 11, 1963, Kennedy labeled civil rights a moral issue and promised a major civil rights bill to end discrimination against African Americans. Five months later, Kennedy was assassinated. 
His successor, Lyndon Johnson, vowed to finish the fight for civil rights in honor of Kennedy. And, propelled by goodwill toward Kennedy and aided by progressive Republicans, Johnson was able to pass the raft of legislation that would end segregation in America. For segregationists like Strom Thurmond, the fact that Johnson, a Southern Democrat, had led the charge was the last straw. In 1964, Thurmond announced that going forward, he was a Republican. Over the next few years, segregationist Democrats like Thurmond jumped to the Republican Party in droves, and the South began shifting from blue to red. The identity of the Democratic Party as progressive was settling in, and a new wave of conservative Republicans was about to shift the brand there as well. The Republican candidate for president that year represented a new conservative turn for the party. Barry Goldwater was definitely not a Rockefeller Republican. He hoped to pick up disenfranchised Southern Democrats by opposing the Civil Rights Bill. And his message of states' rights and limited federal government sounded a lot like what segregationists had been saying for years. As a result, Goldwater won the Deep South, but failed in every other state except his home state of Arizona. Four years later, Republican Richard Nixon tried again, appealing to white suburbanites frightened by scenes of urban riots on TV with his message of law and order. Goldwater and Nixon were experimenting with a new Southern strategy, focusing on the newly christened Sunbelt states from Florida to California and appealing to conservative white voters who felt the country was changing too fast and headed in the wrong direction. Nixon figured if he turned the South red, he could win the White House without needing to appeal to urban liberals or black voters at all. He was right. Fast forward to 1980. Ronald Reagan raised eyebrows by launching his presidential campaign in the Deep South with a pledge of support for states' rights. Critics took it as a coded appeal to Dixiecrats, the old states' rights party of segregationist Southern Democrats. The fact that Reagan launched his campaign and talked about states' rights in a Mississippi county best known as the site of the murder of three civil rights workers didn't help. Reagan's political and social conservatism built on Nixon's prior success and turned the South bright red. Between 1968 and 1988, the Republican Party had become the party of white, Christian, conservative America. And the Democratic Party was now the party of radical progressive leftists and hippies. Oh, and black church ladies. Right. About that. Black Christians are socially conservative. They're theologically conservative. So why aren't they politically conservative too? Black Christians and white Christians vote very differently, partly because their histories and life experiences are vastly different. When white Christians look at the Supreme Court, for example, they see the reason abortion is legal and school prayer isn't. But when black Christians look at the Supreme Court, they see the reason they can vote and pursue housing and employment without blatant discrimination. That difference in perspective has a huge impact on whether you see the federal government as part of the problem or part of the solution. Having the right to hear a Christian prayer in your local public school doesn't mean much if you're not allowed to attend your local public school. And think about the words progressive and conservative. A progressive believes things should be improved by making progress, by moving forward, by progressing. A conservative believes the good things we presently have are at risk of being lost and need to be conserved, or even revived from the past. So the best way to explain why white Christians vote for conservative candidates and black Christians vote for progressive candidates may simply be this. What do we see when we look in the rearview mirror? White Christians see a simpler time when everyone went to church, when we prayed in school, when abortion was illegal and gender roles were clear. When black Christians look in the rearview mirror, the view is very different. They see fire hoses and church bombings and lynchings. They see Strom Thurmond saying, we will never let Negroes into our theaters, swimming pools, homes, or churches. They see white Christians applauding Strom Thurmond for saying that and then re-electing him to the Senate for five decades until he dies in office at 2003 at the age of 100. Is this beginning to make sense? 
There are other issues. Conservative white Christians see sin mostly as an individual problem, wrongs committed by one person against another, requiring only individual confession and repentance as the solution. Black Christians also see sin as a systemic problem, sinful systems needing broader solutions and broader confession and repentance. So to wrap all this up, it really doesn't help that we've only got two viable parties and that we've decided one is for people who want things to change and the other is for people who want things to stay the same. I'm oversimplifying, but you get the point. The Bible calls us to hold on to what is good while also working toward what is best, to conserve and progress. And neither party lines up with that very well. But I hope at least now you understand how Christians from different backgrounds can read the same Bible, pray to the same God, and come to very different conclusions about who's going to get their vote.